75191, Roger. Uh, do you have someone with some medical training uh, here? They were saying uh, possibly try to cough as hard as you can. That might help relieve some of the pain in the short term. But uh, whatever you need to do, uh, we'll, uh, we'll be here. November uh, 191, this is the supervisor. I need you to uh, find a road um, rather than circling up over there. Is there a road nearby that you can uh, try to find and land safely on? November 191, if you can uh, safely put the aircraft down at this point in a field on a road, that's what we'd recommend uh, rather than losing consciousness at altitude there. Eric, you 191, I want to help you every way that I can. Um, if there's any way you can get that airplane on the ground so we can get ambulance or uh, if we can get uh, fire and ambulance to you. Cherokee 191, suspected target lost. Uh, do you still hear Sioux Falls approach? Hello, and thank you for joining us for episode 98 of the Aviation News Talk podcast, where we bring you general aviation news and safety tips that pilots and student pilots like you can use. Now, you just heard a recording from liveatc.net involving a pilot with chest pain who crashed and died, and we'll talk more about that accident in the news. Later, we'll talk in detail about efficient and effective pilot communications and which words you can eliminate during readbacks to ATC. Plus, this week in the news, the pilot of an airplane that broke up and crashed in Southern California had had multiple run-ins with the FAA before. ForeFlight announces airport 3D views, and an arrest has been made in relation to an airplane that took a bullet hole while flying here in California. Welcome to Aviation News Talk, where we talk about general aviation. I'm Max Truscott. I'm here to educate and inform you and hopefully have a little fun. If you are new to the show, I'm the 2008 National Flight Instructor of the Year, and I specialize in Cirrus aircraft like the SR-20, SR-22, and now the SF-50 Vision Jet. So if you're starting to think about maybe buying one of these aircraft someday or you would like some training in one, please call me today for pre-consultation and possibly a free demo flight. Now, last week in episode 97, we talked with Mark Eppner about starting a flying club. So if you missed that episode, you may want to check it out. All this and more, and the news starts now. From the MitchellRepublic.com, the NTSB Safety Board has released its preliminary report into a deadly plane crash west of Sioux Falls last month. That plane, flown by 69-year-old Comet Haraldson of Sioux Falls, was destroyed after crashing into a field after Haraldson reported chest pains. The report doesn't give a cause of the crash, saying it's still waiting on autopsy and toxicology results for Haraldson before making any determination. The NTSB says the pilot told Sioux Falls Approach Control he was having chest pains and was blacking out. The plane ended up crashing in a field. The pilot was found about 100 feet from the plane. In a follow-up story, it indicated that his medical had expired a few months before the crash. And I do want to mention in passing that chest pains is one of the symptoms for carbon monoxide poisoning. So we'll give you an update uh, when the toxicology reports are released on that. Of course, we talked in detail about carbon monoxide in episode 88 and 90 of the Aviation News Talk podcast. From KSL.com, this is the first of two stories about a pilot who had a fatal plane crash in Southern California you may have heard about. The man was piloting a small plane that broke apart over Southern California neighborhood. And the story says that he had false credentials identifying him as a retired Chicago police officer. He was killed when the twin-engine plane broke up shortly after takeoff and fell in pieces in Yorba Linda, igniting a fire in a home where four people died. The cause of the crash has not been determined. The credentials found at the crash included false retirement papers and a police badge bearing the same number as a badge reported lost in 1978, according to Chicago police. Now, when I first read that story, I didn't really think I would be including it here in the news until I found a follow-up story about the same crash from the Mercury News. And it says that the pilot of this ill-fated uh, Cessna had changed his name multiple times with the FAA. And NTSB records on file show that a pilot with one of those names had his license suspended for 120 days in 1977 for lying to an air traffic controller that he had an instrument rating allowing him to fly in low visibility conditions during a trip from Las Vegas to Long Beach. Then in 1980, the license of the pilot was suspended for 30 days for failing to have a registration certificate aboard his aircraft, missing an annual inspection, and a hydraulic fluid leak that left his wheel brake unairworthy. The pilot was a 75-year-old sushi restaurant owner from Gardnerville, Nevada, and he was flying solo when he took off from Fullerton in his 1981 Cessna 414 at about 1.35 p.m. Just 10 minutes later, the twin-engine aircraft began to break up in flight. Investigators have said they don't know what caused the crash. 
And from Catherine'sReport.com, a small plane crashes without a pilot on board. This occurred at the Modesto Airport here in Northern California. A pair of pilots were reportedly working on the electrical system of a Beechcraft V-35B Bonanza, manipulating the propeller, but said it wouldn't start. When the pilots walked away, the propeller suddenly engaged on its own and taxied away, hitting a car and a fence. The pilots told police the plane took off at speeds around 40 miles per hour. The plane was moving toward busy Mitchell Road after it clipped a parked car. Quote, if it was to get over that grass and get onto Mitchell Road, we would really have had a problem on our hands trying to stop that plane with nobody inside it, said Sergeant Mark Phillips with the Modesto Police Department. Phillips said it was a good thing the plane hit the vehicle because it changed direction, diverting the plane from a hangar that was occupied at the time of the incident. Two structures were damaged by the plane, but no one was hurt in the crash. From ADN.com, a teenager was arrested in a southwest Alaska village after reportedly grabbing hold of an airplane's controls while the plane was in flight. State troopers said the 16-year-old, who was seated in the front right seat of a plane operated by Ute Commuter Air Service, grabbed the pilot's yoke control shortly after the plane took off, causing it to, quote, enter a steep dive and then a dive toward the ground. The pilot was able to regain control of the plane after another passenger subdued the teen, state troopers said. The plane, which had been en route to Bethel from Napakiak, returned to Napakiak, where it landed safely. No one was injured, according to state troopers. The 16-year-old, who has not been identified, was taken into custody. The Alaska Department of Public Safety said it is working with the FBI, the Bethel District Attorney's Office, and the State Division of Juvenile Justice to investigate the accident. It's unclear how many people were on board the aircraft or what the aircraft type was. From CNBC.com, two House lawmakers proposed legislation last week that would ensure federal aviation personnel, such as air traffic controllers and airline safety inspectors, would be paid in a government shutdown as another funding deadline looms next week. Lawmakers now have until February 15th to come up with a border security deal or risk another shutdown. It proposes using a special fund to continue to pay FAA personnel, including the country's roughly 14,000 air traffic controllers. The funding wouldn't apply to TSA officers because they work under the Department of Homeland Security and not the FAA. And as we went to record this, there was an announcement that there may be a deal uh, struck to avoid a shutdown. We'll obviously have to see how that plays out later this week. From Flying Magazine at FlyingMag.com, in a move aimed at expanding the limitations of electric flight, aerospace giant Airbus has announced a partnership with Air Race E, the world's first electric airplane race set to launch its inaugural series in 2020. We first mentioned Air Race E back in episode 83 in November, but at that time, Airbus was not involved. Airbus is now listed as an official founding partner of Air Race E, a competition that, quote, aims to drive the development and adoption of cleaner, faster, and more technologically advanced electric engines that can be applied to urban air mobility vehicles and eventually commercial aircraft, according to organizers. Air Race E will follow a format similar to the Air Race 1 series of Formula 1 air racing. Eight electric-powered airplanes will race against each other in a tight 5-kilometer circuit flying just 10 meters above the ground and at speeds faster than any land-based motorsport. Quote, we want to motivate manufacturers to showcase their technologies across the full spectrum of electric propulsion systems and component, as said the chief technology officer of Airbus. This partnership enables us to demonstrate our commitment to staying at the leading edge of electric propulsion and developing a new ecosystem. For more information about Air Race E, visit airrace.e.com. From FlyingMag.com, ForeFlight brings airport 3D views. This week, ForeFlight announced its latest feature. And if you, like probably all pilots, have ever had trouble finding an airport and or the runway in use during the final stages of the flight, this new feature will be appreciated. Airport 3D View allows you to explore the airport environment in a 3D image format. The image can be zoomed in and out, placing you at different altitudes shown on the screen. You can also rotate around the airport in various planes from a 3-degree angle up to 89 degrees, providing views from the final approach segment directly from above and everything in between. The pictures, enhanced by high-resolution terrain imagery from Jeppesen, allows you to explore the landscapes and structures you will see as you approach the runway. The airport 3D view image also includes quick access buttons for each runway at the airport, providing a view from the short final segment. A compass icon shows the location of north in relation to the airport view, providing additional situational awareness. Airport 3D view is available for all airports in the ForeFlight database as long as that database is updated and the software runs on version 11. The feature is not only an excellent pre-flight tool, it can also be used to explore airport environments and places that you might want to visit in the future. 
It's available in a Four Flights Performance Plus subscription, which costs $299.99. Special pricing is available until February 18th with a promo code AIRPORT3D. That's all in all caps, increasing the subscription period from the standard 12 months to 15 months. Now, I got a chance to play with this over the weekend, and when I first tried it, we were up in flight, and that's when we discovered that you really want to uh, look at your destination airport uh, before you take off when you still have a uh, Wi-Fi connection or a, a data connection, uh, because once we were up in the airplane, while we could see data for the airport we just left, we weren't able to uh, get details for our destination since we hadn't previously looked at it, and we no longer had a connection from the aircraft. But I must say, the view that you can get from 3D was really spectacular. It really made it very easy to see all the details around the airport. In international news from the WashingtonPost.com, a flight instructor is being investigated in an Italian air crash that left seven dead. A prosecutor is investigating a flight instructor who survived a mid-air collision between a small tourist plane and a helicopter in the Italian Alps. Authorities said the bodies of the last two people from the crash in Italy's Val d'Aosta region were found over the weekend, raising the death toll to seven. The French flight instructor was one of two survivors of the accident over the Retour Glacier. Italian news agency ANSA quoted Aosta chief prosecutor Paolo Fortuna saying he was investigating the uh, instructor for alleged manslaughter and had questioned him in a hospital intensive care unit. ANSA said the instructor reportedly was sitting in the rear of the plane and his students were in front. The students, a Belgian man and a Frenchman, died. The helicopter was bringing skiers to the glacier. And I must say that here in the U.S., it seems rare that charges are brought against pilots when a crash occurs, but that's not always the case in other parts of the world. Also in international news from QueenslandCountryLife.com, many are concerned about the impact of CASA changes in Australia on angel flight. The Civil Aviation Safety Authority is considering a plan to introduce a new minimum safety standard for community service flights, which angel flight says could see up to 80% of their volunteer pilots drop out. People such as Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association Executive Director Benjamin Morgan, who we've had on this show, says thousands of private pilots will withdraw from the service, judging it to be too onerous and unsustainable to continue volunteering. Proposals include increasing minimum experience requirements from 250 to 400 hours, changing pilot currency from 90 days to 30 days, and requiring maintenance of commercial charter industry standards. The latter has been estimated as costing as much as $85,000 for a Beechcraft Bonanza A36 engine and higher for others. And they have a story here of a couple, Nigel, 83, and his wife, Lindsay, 76, who live on a property south of Blackhall and have used Angel Flight Services seven or eight times since Nigel was diagnosed with cancer three and a half years ago. They say the service is their only viable means of accessing quarterly scans and monitoring services that are not available in western Queensland. Situated 900 kilometers from Toowoomba, where Nigel specialists are located, driving is no longer a feasible option for the couple, and there are no direct commercial flights between the capital region and their hometown. Quote, we're relying very heavily on Angel Flight and are extremely concerned about what is happening. We cannot imagine how we will cope if this essential service is no longer available to us. And we'll provide you any updates that we get uh, in the story if CASA comes out with a final ruling. From AOPA.org, a story from Canada that NAV Canada seeks ADSB antenna diversity. NAV Canada announced its proposed ADSB out performance requirements mandate. Phase one, which would be implemented January 1st, 2021, would include Class A airspace and Class E airspace above flight level 600. Phase two, beginning January 1, 2022, would affect Class B airspace. Well, Class A airspace in Canada is the same as in the United States, from 18,000 feet up to flight level 600. Class B is different. Canada's Class B extends from 12,500 feet MSL up to, but not including, 18,000 feet MSL. Phase 3 is less defined, expanding ADSB as needed to, quote, specific controlled airspace en route or at an airport starting no sooner than 2023. Now, one challenge for lighter GA aircraft is that few ADSB transponders are available that support antenna diversity. Only the Garmin GTX33DES and GTX330DES and the L3 Commercial Avionics Lynx NGT9000 currently support diversity. 
Rune Duke, AOPA Senior Director of Airspace and Air Traffic, is quick to point out that Transport Canada has not yet approved NAV Canada's request. He said, quote, AOPA is continuing to work with COPA, the Canadian Owner and Pilots Association, to advocate for only justifiable airspace and equipage mandates. And one thing this article doesn't explain is just what is antenna diversity? And as a ham radio operator, I can tell you that basically diversity means using more than one antenna to get better signal coverage. So typically a transponder antenna would be located on the bottom of an aircraft with a diversity option. You would add another antenna on top of the aircraft, which would get a better coverage of aircraft that are flying above you and communicating with your aircraft via ADS-B. And finally, from California's Central Valley, a story of a pilot who was shot out in mid-flight. This comes from yourcentralvalley.com. And a Kingsburg pilot speaking out after a bullet hits his crop duster in mid-flight and a 55-year-old suspect arrested. Last Friday, agricultural pilot Mark Trinkle was out fertilizing a field that he says he has flown the same way over the past four to five years with no problems until this year one of the neighbors was mad enough to supposedly shoot at me, Trinkle said. On landing, Trinkle discovered a bullet hole through the plane's spreader, which holds fertilizer. The spreader is only about seven feet below where Trinkle was seated. Quote, I love what I do, and you know, wires, any kinds of obstructions of the field, that's all hazards, he said. But shooting has never crossed my mind. Saturday, Tulare uh, Sheriff Ag Crimes Detectives tell us they acted on witness information regarding suspect 55-year-old Roy Vanderveld of Vizalia. He had made threats of shooting the plane down for, quote, scaring his cattle. Officials served a warrant at Vanderveld's home, which detectives say was next to the farm where Trinkle was flying. Uh, the detective said, quote, something to this caliber, it's a pretty serious crime. Trinkle, a husband and father of three, is now back in the sky. He says it's easy to make flight adjustments and the whole situation could have been resolved differently. He said, don't go to the extreme to shoot somebody. The suspect is now facing several charges, including shooting at an occupied aircraft and attempted homicide. Well, that's the news for this week. Coming up, my weekly updates. And then we'll get to our main topic about effective pilot communications and just which words you can cut out when talking to ATC. All right here on the Aviation News Talk Podcast. And welcome back. Oh, I have so many different things to tell you. Let's talk first about a prop strike that occurred recently in Southern California in a Cirrus SR-20. Now, the pilot is based up here in Northern California and is relatively low time. I'm guessing perhaps, yeah, maybe 150 hours. And it's someone who didn't fly a whole lot of hours last year, though. I did fly with that person three or four times, including once about uh, two months before the incident. Now, the pilot told me that just as the aircraft was touching down, the tower called, probably with uh, runway exiting instructions. The pilot then pushed the push to talk button to respond and apparently accidentally pulled back on the stick while pushing the push to talk button and the aircraft became airborne again. Now, this led to a series of bounces, which ultimately led to the prop contacting the ground uh, and bending it and damaging, obviously. Now, I think I may have mentioned uh, recently that I know another serious pilot who wasn't a client of mine who had a prop strike in December. Now, that one was a night landing in which he admitted he was fatigued and he thought he was higher than he was. And so he was surprised when the aircraft actually touched down. That, too, led to a series of bounces, the third of which apparently bent the prop. Now, in both cases, the problem could have been easily solved after the first bounce by just adding full power and going around. So I think the key takeaway for pilots is that Sometimes we just try to save bad landings that aren't meant to be saved. <laughs> Instead, what we should be thinking about is just adding full power, going around, and starting all over again. Now, with that most recent landing down in Southern California, since the aircraft took off again after the pilot applied a little back pressure on the side stick, that tells me the aircraft didn't touch down in a full stall landing and was probably a little flat and you know, certainly a little fast as well. Because if that first touchdown had been a full stall landing, the aircraft wouldn't have taken off again when back pressure was applied to the controls. <laughs> of course, if the pilot hadn't responded to ATC at that critical moment while touching down, most likely nothing would have happened and we wouldn't be talking about this now. All of which got me thinking about the many times a tower has called me immediately after I touched down while I was still working on controlling the plane and trying to break it after touchdown. So I started wondering, is there a rule that tells controllers to not talk when an aircraft is touching down? 
So I posed that question to Brandon Gonzalez. He's the host of uh, Podcasting on a Plane podcast. And we had him here on the show back in episode 84. And here's what he wrote back to me. He said, yes, it does mention not doing that in the JO 7110.65, which by the way is the controller's handbook. He says, but there's also been a separate piece of guidance about that too that comes from ASAP reports. Now, I didn't know what that was, so I looked it up. That's the Aviation Safety Action Program, which is apparently similar to the NASA ASRS program that pilots are familiar with, in which they file what pilots often call the NASA form for inadvertent violations or for safety issues they'd like to report. But this is a separate program. It's run by the FAA, and it's a voluntary disclosure program that encourages industry employees to report safety information. Brandon continues, he says, stuff like this is also covered in a general rule about not transmitting to pilots during critical phases of flight and, quote, immediately after takeoff or, quote, immediately after touchdown. It's specifically mentioned there as well. It's also taught at the FAA Academy, which is back in Oklahoma City where controllers uh, first trained to become a controller, he says, and in the simulators. In reality, though, sometimes we do it by accident, like if it's really busy and we get talking a little too fast. But yeah, tell the pilot to feel free to not acknowledge or even to listen if it's a critical time. And like you said, Max, always aviate first. So Brandon, thanks for your feedback on that. And uh, you know, I think there are good lessons here to be taken away for, for all of us. And let me tell you about a recent IFR flight I had into Medford, Oregon, where the weather was hovering right at minimums for the ILS-14 approach. The minimums there are 1,500 feet, which is 200 feet AGL, with an RVR of 1,800 feet. Now, for non-IFR pilots, RVR is the runway visual range, and that's the distance that electronic equipment called a transmissometer down near the runway itself is able to use to measure the visibility along the length of the runway. Now, not all ILS-equipped airports have this, but it does give you a much better idea of the visibility a landing pilot might see versus the visibility as reported from the tower. Now, when we first started listening to the ATIS, the RVR was 1,200 feet, so way below the minimums. But as we got closer to the airport and the weather was improving, it got up to 2,000 feet, which was just slightly above the 1,800-foot uh, uh, RVR minimums. So as we were shooting the approach, I told the pilot who was hand-flying the approach that he should keep looking at the instruments and that I would be the one to look out the window for the approach lights. And just as we got to the minimum altitude uh, where we would have been allowed to descend and land, which of course was 200 feet above the runway, I picked up the approach lights through the fog and I announced that I had the, the lights in sight. Now, I think the pilot must have pitched up slightly at that time as I saw the nose rise a little and I actually then lost the approach light, so I called for a go around. And I think the pilot may have been a little slow to add power as we were a little bit slower at that point than I would have liked because I glanced over at the airspeed. But then he uh, got us out of there, full power, climbed out on the uh, the missed approach. We then flew over to another airport, landed, waited for about an hour, and then flew back and were able to land where the conditions were a little bit better than that. Now, as we discussed this later, uh, he and I came up with a couple things that we could have done that might have helped. And another pilot we talked with uh, came up with a third thing as well. First, there's a rule that I was not thinking about as we flew the approach since I hadn't you know, used this rule in a long, long time and hadn't really flown an approach uh, this close to minimums in probably a couple of years. And that's in uh, FAR 91.175, take off and landing under IFR. It says that you must have at least one of 10 things in sight in order to be able to land. And most of these are features associated with uh, the runway or the, the runway lighting. Now, one of those things is the approach lighting system. Now, that would be the first thing you would come up to as you approach the uh, the runway. But there's an exception for that one item. Uh, if you see any of the other nine items, you can land. And you can start to descend if you see the approach lights, but you can't land until you have any of the other uh, references in sight. It says, quote, except that the pilot may not descend below 100 feet above the touchdown zone elevation using the approach lights as a reference unless the red terminating bars or the red side row bars are also distinctly visible and identifiable. So if I had remembered this rule, we could have descended another 100 feet after we saw the approach lights, which might have gotten us down low enough to see the runway. But of course, we didn't descend and we didn't uh, see the runway and lost the approach lights. By the way, that rule applies for any type of approach being flown to an airport with approach lights. So for example, even a VOR approach. Uh, now, so the minimums on a typical VR approach might be as low as maybe 400 feet above the ground. And if you saw the approach lights, you could descend another 300 feet, which is quite a bit, until you were now just 100 feet above the touchdown zone elevation. 
Now, most likely, if an airport has approach lighting, it has an approach with much better minimums than you'd find in a typical VOR. So this is a pretty unlikely example for applying this rule, but just wanted to make it clear that anytime you have the approach lights in sight, you can descend to the point where you're just 100 feet above the touchdown zone elevation. Had we done that, that would have helped. Another thing that we could have done was have the infrared camera turned on so that we might have gotten a better view of the runway. Now, we wouldn't have been able to land until we saw the runway visually, but having the IR camera on might have helped spot and help identify other parts of the runway environment and helped us uh, you know, see those things. And finally, we could have agreed that when I had the approach lights in sight that I would have made the landing. I think this is the way the airline crews handle landings that are below the typical 200-foot ILS minimums. For example, if they're flying an ILS to CAT 2 or CAT 3 minimums, which are even lower. So anyway, some good lessons learned, good takeaways that I'll remember the next time I fly an approach that's going to be close to minimums. And I'd like to extend thanks to a couple people, starting first with uh, Patreon supporter Bob Luton, who wrote a really nice article about the Aviation News Talk podcast for his EAA chapter newsletter. That's chapter 20, based at the San Carlos Airport here in California. Now, if anyone listening would like a copy of that article so that you could modify it and use it for your own chapter newsletter, please contact me, and I'll be happy to uh, send that out to you. And shortly thereafter, I heard from Bruce Estes, who wrote an article as well for chapter 1541, and that's the EAA chapter up at Lincoln, California, up near uh, Sacramento. Been into that airport a few times there. So both of you, Bob and Bruce, thanks so much for writing letters for your newsletter about the Aviation News Talk podcast. Now, I ran across something on Facebook the other day, which really surprised me. Somebody was talking about the need to use parachutes when doing spin training. And some of the initial people who responded uh, said exactly what I had always known to be true and have been telling people for uh, all the years that I've been a CFI. But apparently there's been a change, which uh, was new to me and also to some other people uh, on the forum there. So the rule, as I understood it in the past, was that you must wear parachutes when doing spins unless you are training for a rating that requires spin training. And that only rating was CFI training, which my understanding and that of many others in the past was, unless you were out there learning to become a CFI, you had to have parachutes on when you're doing spins. Well, it turns out that there is a letter of interpretation out from the FAA, which was issued recently. It was in 2018. It was sent to Spartan College, who I guess was asking for clarification on just this rule. And apparently the rationale the FAA has that as long as you are doing training of any kind, you can go ahead and uh, perform spins without a parachute. Now, of course, you'd have to have a CFI on board uh, who is giving spin training to you. And the rationale apparently is that since one rating uh, doesn't require you to wear parachutes, then any training uh, doesn't have to require the use of uh, parachutes. Hope I uh, uh, interpreted that correctly. I'm going to put a link in the show notes here so you can read that letter uh, for yourself. And I want to pass out a couple of Valentines. This is uh, Valentine's uh, week. And uh, this is a concept that Planet Money uh, podcast does every year. They pass out mentions to shows that they like and admire and maybe had wished that they had done. So let me mention a couple of things I've run across recently that I really like. Planet Money, we'll start with them. They had an episode called Lost a Plane. And this is not general aviation, but it's still, I think, something pilots would be interested in. It's all about uh, Norwegian Air uh, flying a 737 across the uh, Middle East. They uh, lost an engine, so they were now a single engine jet. And so they diverted and landed in Iran where they have no facilities and where there's a big, huge complication, which is that there are all kinds of uh, trade sanctions against Iran, which makes it just about impossible to bring in parts to repair the engine. So that aircraft has been there for a couple months at this point, and apparently they've started working on it, but I think it's still there. Fascinating episode, so check out Planet Money. And also, the podcast How I Built This recently had an interview with JetBlue Airways founder David Neelam. And, and David has started multiple airlines, at least three, I think, that were mentioned in the uh, podcast. So that's a pretty fascinating episode as well at uh, How I Built This. And finally, I wanted to mention a video that I saw on the uh, Sonics website that includes uh, AOPA uh, writer Dave Hirschman. Now, Dave's been writing great articles for many years for AOPA. And he got to fly the Subsonics Sportjet JSX-2. Now, I've talked on this show here about the only uh, certificated uh, single-engine jet in the world, which is the Vision Jet. 
This is a single engine jet as well, but it's not a certificated aircraft. It's an experimental aircraft, one that you can build yourself. And it's a single seat aircraft, by the way, which makes training kind of interesting. You know, <laughs> who, uh, who wants to go solo for the first time uh, in an aircraft without any flight training? Well, they've come up with a rather novel solution, and that is that training is offered in a jet-powered glider. Now, there's something I had not heard of before. That glider has two seats, has a very similar, if not the same, jet engine on it, and it touches down at about the same height above the runway. So I'll put a link in the show notes here to that video with Dave Hirschman about the Subsonics Sportjet JSX-2. And let me talk briefly about Patreon. These are the folks that help support the show, and they get a few goodies in return. So folks who donate at the $4 per month level, which is not that much. What is that, a cup of coffee these days? They get full access to our show notes, so they can read all the details of each of the different stories we've talked about. And a lot of times, I don't read the full story. So you can go ahead and see in bold what I read, and you can read the other half of the story that I didn't have time to, uh, to talk about. And then at the $8 a month and up level, those folks get to see all of the cut stories. And each week, I usually cut about 10 stories that just didn't make it into the news because we just don't have enough time to do that. Anyway, special thanks to our new supporters who include Ashley White, Sari Mactis, William Remington. He's our first uh, new supporter in month of February. Sid Sada. Also, thanks to Russ Irwin, who edited his pledge up to $8 a month. And I'm going to apologize in advance. I'll probably get this name wrong, but it looks like uh, Brian Beerley. Thanks so much for being new supporters. By the way, we love getting new supporters each month because sometimes it's kind of like two steps forward and two steps backwards. We may get a few new supporters, but then a few uh, people either drop out or their credit cards have declined. So uh, let's go ahead and see if we can make it three steps forward this month. Go on out to the Patreon site at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. Take a look at all the great posts that I post there under the post tab. Those are free to look at and think about supporting the show if you're in a position to do so. Now, this is the first news show of the month where I thank all of our super supporters that donate more than $20 a month. They include Jeremy Zawadny, who's a software developer, Peter Long, a pilot in Australia, Seth Lake, military instructor pilot in Arkansas, who's got a podcast at gonogo.aero and also a flight school, Jason Blair, who I talked with on the phone again this week. He's a DPE and runs a blog at jasonblair.net, Joseph Haggerty II, a Mooney owner and pilot, Michael Rogers, a Sears owner and pilot in Southern California. Michael Spain, student pilot in Oklahoma. Larry Noe from New York, New York, flies Bonanza and just bought a Cirrus. Congratulations, Larry. Carl and Ann Rossi of Maine Cooncat Aviation. They operate three Cessna T-40 aircraft. Roger Griggs, he has got about 2,000 hours on a TBM 850 and currently has a new Meridian 600. Uh, Chuck Price, he's a guy I've flown with a number of times. He's at uh, Two Simple.ai. Don Dillman, professional pilot who runs a training center for a major carrier, owns a Bonanza F-33A, and got his CFI reinstated, which is awesome. Stella Sue, who I fly with in a Cirrus. She's currently uh, working on her private. Jonathan Weisswasser, a vascular surgeon and also ham radio operator, flies a Meridian. Jim Barrett, down in Monterey, California, runs Sonics ESD that specializes in active noise reduction. He flies a Cirrus. Fabio Comlos, a doctor who I fly with occasionally here in Silicon Valley. Lance Fletcher, former crew chief in the Air Force on the F-111, said that he's finally taking the plunge and working on his uh, flying certificate. Moj Kazi, software developer in Silicon Valley, who's been helping me with the AviationNewsTalk.com website. Tyson Weiss, co-founder and CEO of ForeFlight. And, uh, of course, that's the most popular iOS flight planning app in the U.S. I thank him for his generous support. Adam Nunn flies a Piper Cherokee in Texas. Chris Carnahan flies a 1955 VTEL Bonanza out of St. Louis. Anthony Pitt, private pilot in sunny Brisbane, Australia, flies a 172 out of the Red Cliff Airport. Jeffrey Bell, he's a surgeon who was working on his CFI, and he flies a Citation Bravo. David DeCurtis, he stepped up recently into the Honda Jet. Ed Varso, he has been in law enforcement for over 20 years, and he's a member of the Riverside Pilots Club in Southern California. And Antoine Hanekop, who owns a Cirrus and who I've flown with in Australia. Jack Downey, new owner of an SR-22 in Boulder, Colorado. He's looking for a partner. It's a 2002. So if you want his contact information and you're near Boulder, let me know. Paul Peterson, a CFI in Livermore, California. Peter Alberti, who's got the CFISkills.com website for delivering world-class training for CFIs. Glenn Neeson, he's a software guy working on his uh, instrument and commercial. 
Chris Ostrowski. He's an aerospace physiologist for the U.S. Air Force, stationed in Dayton, Ohio. And Stephen Elop, who flies at Cessna 182 and the Citation M2. And I want to thank everyone who helps contribute to the show in any way, whether it be through reviews that you leave on various sites or your emails that you send to me or, of course, your contributions for Patreon. Now, in a moment, we're going to be talking about how to make your communications more efficient when you're talking with ATC right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. Well, today's topic is also a listener question, which came in from James in California. And he wrote, I just listened to your interview with Brandon. That would be episode 84, where we talked with Brandon Gonzalez. And he says, I think it'd be really helpful for you to go into more detail on item number six, which was repeating things verbatim. He says, I don't think many pilots are particularly clear on what must be repeated and what can be left off. Clarence says, certainly, but what about the and early right turnout or expedite part of a takeoff clearance? Make 360s. And what about the various in route stuff? He says, I tend to repeat verbatim at the very real risk of wasting further time when the controller repeats the instruction because he's trying to get me to say a word I had thought I could leave off. Well, James, that is really an excellent question, and it's really an important issue, and it's one that I work on constantly with my clients, and it's a topic that you don't often see covered in print or online. So why do some pilots repeat back everything verbatim, and why is that a potential problem? In my experience, sometimes uh, lesser experienced pilots will repeat everything back. And frankly, that's definitely better than the alternative of not repeating key items, which as James mentions, then results in ATC having to say it again and ask you to read it back again. So both things, either repeating back everything or not repeating back enough, well, they can be a problem. So here's the essence of the problem, and that's limited bandwidth. Now, when we're talking on the radio, it's not like when you're calling customer service on the telephone where it's just you and the agent on the same line. Instead, it's kind of like being on a party line. Now, let me explain. As recent as the 1960s in the small town I grew up in northern Pennsylvania, the phone company saved money by only running one set of phone lines down rural roads outside of town. And all the people who lived on the same section of a particular road, well, they all shared the same phone line, which meant only one neighbor at a time could make or receive a phone call. But just like the radio in your airplane, Everybody could listen to the conversation, which I'm told was quite common. But there's one big difference. On the telephone, if two people talk at the same time, you can hear what both people are saying. But that's not true on an aircraft radio. You may have noticed that when two people talk at the same time on the radio, usually you just hear a large squealing noise and you can't hear what either person is saying. Now, that squeal, by the way, is a tone that's created by the slight difference in the carrier frequencies of the two transmitters that are transmitting at the same time. And although both radios might be tuned, for example, to 118.6, both radios are almost certainly just slightly off that frequency, but not very much, but just enough so the difference in those frequencies is a frequency that falls into our hearing range, and that's the tone or squeal that you hear. Now, why this happens is because aircraft radios became common back in the 1930s, almost 90 years ago. And those radios used AM modulation, the same type used by AM radio stations, which also, by the way, date back to that same time period. Now, if aviation radios had been developed a little later, they might have used FM modulation, which has been common in police radios up until fairly recently. One advantage FM has over AM is what's called the capture effect. And that means that an FM receiver, if it hears two signals, the stronger signal is demodulated and you hear just that signal. So arguably, FM or just about any other form of modulation would be better than AM. And by the way, uh, us ham radio operators often called it ancient modulation for AM. But we now have several hundred thousand airplanes flying around the world with radios that use AM. And you can imagine it would cost a small fortune to convert them all. And there'd be some timing issues, too. I mean, did they all change to FM on a certain day? So we're really stuck with AM modulation for the foreseeable future. Now, if you're on a really quiet frequency, none of what we're going to talk about today really matters. But someday, you may be at a very busy airport or on a very busy frequency, and that it is important that you choose your words carefully so that you can serve bandwidth. And even if a frequency isn't busy, ATC could still have a critical need to communicate, which they can't do until you stop talking. So, for example, two airplanes might be headed toward each other and ATC needs to warn them. Or they might have to call an airplane that's made a mistake and is crossing an active runway without permission. And that happened recently in Tucson, Arizona, 
where just as an F-16 was just about to touch down, a King Air started to enter the runway right at the threshold. So the frequency was clear, so ATC was able to order the F-16 to go around in time to avoid the King Air. But still, it was a pretty close call. So we want to be efficient in our communications and use the minimum number of words necessary. But we also want to be effective and not use so few words that we trigger a whole new round of transmissions in which the controller needs to repeat what they've already said and you've already heard just to elicit a critical readback from the pilot. Now, the examples we'll talk about today only apply when you're talking with ATC, but some of the same concepts apply at non-towered airports. For example, I've been in the pattern at the San Martin airport when there are five planes in the pattern at that non-towered airport. And if one person talks too much, well, it compromises safety. So here are a couple of things to think about. First, think before you push the push to talk switch. Pilots often give their position wrong, so you want to figure it out before you talk. And you might want to consider using the nearest function. But if you look up the nearest function on many GPSs, you're going to have to invert the direction shown because that's the direction to the airport. And you want to tell ATC your direction from the airport. Now, one exception would be the Garmin 430s and 530s. If you're in the nav group and you switch to the last page in the group and then move two pages forward from there, you can set that page up to show you the distance from the nearest airport, which is really handy because then you don't have to invert the direction. And second, think about getting flight following first by asking ground if you're at a towered airport before you take off. Because instead, if you were to wait and request flight following after you're airborne, it's a much longer conversation to initiate it, which chews up much more of the limited airtime available to talk on what may be a busy frequency. Now let's talk about the first transmission that you're likely to make at a towered airport. I sometimes hear aircraft say something like, ground, 512 Alpha Mike. And then ground has to say, 512 Alpha Mike, go ahead. And I hear this with a lot of pilots who learn to fly in Europe, so I'm guessing that's fairly standard there. And I sometimes hear it with pilots who are trained in the military. And I must say, I think it's fairly non-standard in the civilian aviation world here in the U.S. Unless the ground frequency is exceptionally busy, just go ahead and say what you need to say. In which case, I would start with the name of the facility, and then who you are, where you are, and what you want. So I might say... Palo Alto Ground, Cirrus 512 Alpha Mike, Rose Sierra. We'd like a crosswind departure and we have hotel. So at my airport, Ground is going to take that information and they're going to pass it along to the local controller, that is the tower controller. But at some airports that doesn't happen and so Ground just doesn't care which direction you're going to depart because they're going to expect you to tell the tower controller instead. And you'll probably figure out uh, who wants to know that at your airport, whether it's the ground controller or the tower controller. Now, when they assign you a runway, you absolutely must read back the runway number. That's in the FARs. And if you don't do that, most ground controllers are fairly good and persistent about calling you back and asking you to read back the runway number that you've been assigned. So this is a very common example of where you make extra work for everyone if you don't follow the requirement to read back the runway number. So just remember this simple rule. Anytime you're on the ground and ground mentions a runway number to you, read back that runway number (laughs) because if you don't, you're just making extra work for everyone. Now, most pilots I fly with do a pretty good job of this when they're at their home airport and they first start the airplane and then call ground. But then if we fly to another airport and land and have to taxi back, a large percentage of those same pilots don't read back the runway number. Just remember, you always have to read back the runway number to which you've been assigned, even if you're not at your home airport. Now, imagine you've made it to the run-up area and you've completed your run-up and you're ready to go. If you want flight following at most towered airports, they expect you to make that request with ground. But you can also make it with a tower. (laughs) The problem is the tower is often busier than ground. So you're helping everyone if you make that request when you first call ground. Of course, at some towered airports, you can't get flight following from the ground or from the tower. And so you're going to have to wait until you're airborne. That'll be your only choice uh, in order to get flight following from those airports. Now, here's what I say when I'm ready for takeoff. Tower, 512 Alpha Mike, ready to go. And we only have one runway at our airport, but if you have multiple runways, you probably should include the runway number so that tower knows where you are when they clear you for takeoff. At some airports where ground doesn't pass along your departure request to the tower, the tower is going to want to know your direction of flight after takeoff. So at these airports, I might say, tower, 512 Alpha Mike, ready to go, request right crosswind departure. Now, I often hear pilots at my airport 
give too much information. They might say, Tower 512 Alpha Mike holding short runway 31, ready to go, request right crosswind departure. Now that might be appropriate at some airports where we have multiple runways and grounded and pass along your information to the tower. At my airport, you've just said a lot of information the tower already knows. And my tower knows which runway you're at, which direction you're going. So I just tell them I'm ready to go. But before you call the tower telling them you're ready to go, first check the final to see if there's an aircraft about to land. Because if there is, and you call saying you're ready to go, you've just triggered yet another round of communications that would have been unnecessary if you only waited for that aircraft to land. Because if you call before the airplane lands, tower is now going to have to say, Cirrus 512 Alpha Mike, hold short of runway 31. And you're going to have to read back all of that. You'll need to say, Hold short, 31512 Alpha Mike. And if you miss any one of those items and say, for example, hold short, 512 Alpha Mike, you're going to trigger yet another round of communications in which the tower explains that they need to hear you say, hold short, the runway number, and your call sign all in the same transmission. And some airports will require you to say your full call sign when reading back a hold short instruction. So if you read back, hold short, 312 Alpha Mike, the tower might say, I need a full call sign with a hold short back read back. And sometimes I'll hear a pilot make as many as three transmissions to get it right. But the tower will keep trying to work with them to get them to say all three things in the same uh, transmission. Now, by contrast, if you'd only waited for that aircraft to land, you might have instead been given a line up and wait instruction, which technically you don't have to read back. But I think every controller will want to hear you read it back. So definitely read back the part of any instruction that includes the words hold short, line up and wait, we're clear for takeoff. Now, often a tower will include the current winds in a takeoff instruction. For example, United 135, winds 280 to 11, runway 30 left, clear for takeoff. Now, there is really never a need to read back the wind speed the tower gave you, so just reply, clear for takeoff, 30 left, United 135. Let's imagine you were given a squawk code on the ground for flight following, and after takeoff, the tower told you to contact departure. A lot of pilots give way too much information when they first call approach control. They may say, NARCAL approach, Cirrus 51 Alpha Mike, with you, we're a Cirrus SR-20, four miles northeast of Palo Alto, going to Sacramento, and we're level at 2,000. <laughs> you may think that sounds okay, but let's look at all the useless or redundant information in that transmission. In this example, you were given a squawk code on the ground, so the approach controller you're talking with already knows where you are and where you're going, and he certainly knows that you're with him, and he knows that you're serious. So I have to admit, I used to say, you know, with you years ago, but seriously, does that add any information at all to the communication? So by contrast, I would simply say, NARCAL approach, Cirrus 512 Alpha Mike, level 2000. Now here's the difference. That was just seven words versus the 24 words, which is more than three times as much in the first example I gave. And please include your altitude in these initial call-up transmissions to approach. If you don't, the controller will have to ask you for it, which triggers additional communication. Now, when the controller makes the initial response to you after your first call up here, she is required to give you a radar position that they see on their scope and to verify your altitude if you didn't include it in the initial call up. And that might sound something like this. Cirrus 512 Alpha Mike, radar contact, four miles east of Livermore, 2,500, say altitude. Now, anytime a controller mentions your radar position, don't read back the radar position. It's just a waste of time. Now, in the really unlikely event that the radar position they gave is not where you are, well, then, of course, tell them that they have you at the wrong position. But I got to tell you, in my over 40 years of flying, I've never heard approach control misidentify my radar position. Later, when ATC hands you off to another frequency, just repeat back the frequency and your call sign. And when you check in with the next facility, don't give your life story, such as your position, the name of your destination airport, or saying with you. None of that is needed, but they do need your altitude. So I would check in with the next controller by saying NorCal Approach 512 Alpha Mike level 5000 or NorCal Approach Cirrus 512 Alpha Mike 4200 climbing 5000. Approach control will then respond with a barometer setting. For example, 512 Alpha Mike, Salinas altimeter setting 299 or 1. And I would just say in response 2991 512 Alpha Mike. Now, one of the reasons we get flight following is to get traffic information. And here's where pilots waste a lot of words. If approach says Cirrus 2 Alpha Mike traffic 2 o'clock 5 miles, and if you don't see the traffic, just say negative contact 512 Alpha Mike or looking 2 Alpha Mike. It's short, to the point. Anything else you say is wasted words that takes up time on the frequency. And the controller may, of course, need that time to talk with someone else. 
So don't tell them that you've got them on the fish finder or got them on the scope because that just doesn't matter to the controller. What the controller eventually needs to hear from you is that you see the traffic out the window. And when you do, tell the controller traffic in sight to Alpha Mike. Expect the controller to then say, maintain visual separation with that traffic because that transfers responsibility for traffic separation from the controller to you. And you must respond to that maintain visual separation with that traffic instruction. If you don't say anything, the controller needs to repeat it again. Maintain visual separation with that traffic. Now, you don't need to read back the entire instruction. Here's what I do. When a controller says maintain visual separation with that traffic, I'll say Wilco 512 Alpha Mike. Short and efficient. Because Wilco, of course, means will comply. And often that's a nice brief response that tells a controller that you'll do as you've been instructed. Now, what if ATC gives you a heading and an altitude? Well, generally, they want to hear those numbers read back. So if controller says, climb to 4,000 or turn right to 020, most of the time, they want to hear you say those numbers back. But if they say, turn right 020 vector for traffic, don't repeat back the vector for traffic part. Just read back right 020 to Alpha Mike. Now, when you see your destination airport and you're ready to change frequencies, you might say, NorCal approach, 512 Alpha Mike, airport in sight. They might say something like 512 Alpha Mike, switch to advisory frequency and squawk 1200. Or they might say 512 Alpha Mike, contact advisory frequency and remain on that squawk until on the ground. To which I might just reply, Wilco, 2 Alpha Mike. <laughs> Again, nice, short, and sweet. Now, if I'm IFR and I see the airport in sight, I'll let the tower know as they'll then usually clear me for a visual approach unless I've requested to fly a particular instrument approach. And if I'm VFR to a towered airport in busy airspace, I'd like to get traffic advisories as long as possible. So I'll usually wait until approach control tells me to contact the tower, even if I've already had the airport in sight for a while. Now, if you're in non-busy airport going to a towered airport, sure, go ahead and tell approach control that the airport is in sight when you first see it. Now, when you're IFR and you're getting cleared for an approach, you're going to be given four items, which we'll call PHAC, position, heading, altitude, and clearance, plus the full name of the approach. Now, they're going to start off by giving you your radar position. And again, you don't need to read that part back, but definitely read back the heading and the altitude. And if you're having memory lapse because there's just so much to read back, don't read back the full name of the approach. So if approach says 512 Alpha Mike, you're five miles from Cussex, turn left to a heading of 320, maintain 2000 until established, cleared for the ILS 29 right approach. I could read back as little as 320 on the heading, 2000 until established, cleared for the approach to Alpha Mike. And by the way, you can figure out ahead of time most of those things that are going to be said to you before they even say them to you. And if you already know most of what they're going to say, it just makes it that much easier to do the readback. Now, ATC is required to give you a final vector that's less than 30 degrees from the final approach course, which is, of course, published on your instrument chart. So if I'm flying the ILS 29 right into Stockton, if I'm coming from the west, then my last turn is probably going to be to a heading of 320 degrees or maybe 310 degrees. They often already have me at the altitude at which they're going to tell me to maintain. So in this case, I know with a pretty high degree of certainty that I'll be told to turn to a heading of either 320 or maybe 310 and maintain 2,000 feet. And all that makes my readback that much simpler because there are no surprises. So of that whole long clearance, all I really need to do is check to see if the heading is what I expect and if the altitude is different from what I thought it was going to be. And a lot of pilots get tongue-tied reading back the full name of the approach. So instead of saying clear for the ILS 29 right approach, just shorten that part when you read it back and say cleared for the approach. Now, it's important to note whether they clear me for the approach or just tell me to join the localizer. If they tell me I'm cleared for the approach, I can descend along the instrument approaches published on the chart. But if they say 512 Alpha Mike, you're five miles from Cusex, turn left to a heading of 320, maintain 2000, and join the localizer, I may read it back as turn left to 320 to join, maintain 2000 to Alpha Mike. So instead of saying join the localizer, pilots might say to join, and the controller knows that you'll join the localizer and that you'll know not to descend along the localizer because you haven't yet been cleared for the approach. And if they later say clear for the approach, well, then you can descend along the approach as published. Here are some other shortcuts. If you're flying with ATC and they say descend at pilot discretion to 9,000 feet, you might read back PD to 9,000. You'll hear airline pilots do it all the time. Controllers know that PD, like Papa Delta, is shorthand for pilot discretion. And there's one readback that you never have to give. 
When a controller tells you to ident, which means push the ident button on your transponder, you don't have to read back that instruction because pushing the ident button, well, that's considered an acknowledgement of the instruction, so you don't have to read it back. And when reading frequencies, a controller might say, Cirrus 512 Alpha Mic, contact NorCal Approach on 125.35. And to save time, I may just read back 2535 2 Alpha Mic. Short to the point. Plus, instead of having to remember all those numbers the controller just said, which was five numbers, I only have to remember two numbers, 25 and 35, and that's easy to remember. Now, another way to save some bandwidth on the frequency is to get the ATIS early. So instead of you waiting until the controller says, advise when you have the ATIS, and then you having to run off to get the ATIS, and then tell the controller you have the ATIS, why not just get the ATIS before you check in with the final approach controller before your destination? And when you check in with that controller, just tell them as part of your initial call-up that you have information hotel or whatever it is. Otherwise, not having the ATIS leads to multiple additional transitions so that you can finally advise the controller that you have the ATIS. And sometimes I hear pilots end every transmission with thank you. Well, yeah, it shows you're polite, but please don't end all of your transmissions that way. It really takes up time needlessly. And if you really think it's important to say thank you, well, save it for your last transmission with that controller. Or better yet, just do it when they've done something really special or something out of the ordinary to help you out. Now let's talk about the things that James specifically mentioned in his question, which I read back at the beginning here. He said, what about as part of a takeoff clearance if a controller says an early right turnout or expedite? He wants to know, should I read those back? Well, here's how I would handle it. If I made the request for an early right turnout and the controller cleared me for takeoff, early right turnout approved, I would feel okay just replying clear for takeoff to off mic because I'm the one that requested the early right turnout. The tower approved it, and the controller has a pretty reasonable expectation that I'll do that as I'm the one who asked for it. Now, if I didn't request it, and the controller cleared me for takeoff and said make early right turnout, I think the controller is really going to want you to read that back, because if you didn't read back early right turnout, uh, you were not the one that requested it, so the controller has no idea whether you even heard that part of the takeoff clearance unless you read it back. So in that case, I would say clear for takeoff, early right turnout to Alpha Mike. And if a controller says to me, clear for takeoff, expedite aircraft on a one mile final, I would start to move toward the runway even before the controller finished talking. <laughs> the controller is going to be watching me. And if he sees me start moving immediately, yep, he knows I'm expediting. So you could probably reasonably not read that part back. But it's just one word, so yeah, why not? Pretty good idea to just go ahead and read back the expedite. You also said, what if a controller tells you make a 360? Well, that, in my experience, is a relatively rare instruction, except at really busy airports. So I would always read that back. And I'd say as a general rule, if you're given a somewhat uncommon instruction, definitely read that back. And finally, remember that you don't have to respond immediately if you're working on a critical task like touching down on the runway. Yes, the controller may then have to repeat an instruction, but that's a lot better than having a prop strike, which we talked about in the update section. Well, there you have it. All kinds of ways to make your readbacks efficient and effective by reading back just enough to meet the needs of the controller. Coming up, listener feedback right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And welcome back. Lots of listener feedback. Thanks to everyone who has written. Here's one from Leslie in Hawaii. She says, Hi, Max. Love the episode on Four Flight. Most recently, I listened to the Crosswind Landings episode. She says, Two days later, we were invited to fly intra-island with a local Cirrus instructor in an SR-22. Maui has some of the strongest crosswinds in America, so your tips from the podcast immediately came to mind while flying. Good stuff. Looking forward to more. And Leslie apparently does the Fly Maui podcast, if you want to check that out. And this comes from Joe in New Mexico. Joe says, can the Cirrus SR-22 be used for a student pilot to obtain their private pilot's license? Boy, this is a very complicated answer. The answer is yes. <laughs> now I wrote back to him and I said, absolutely. I'm teaching an SR-22 owner now, and he'll be doing his first solo very soon. And all I can tell you is that most of the people that I work with in Cirrus who are getting their privates do in the SR-20, it's a little faster, a little easier, but I have worked with a few people who went out and bought an SR-22. And even though it takes them a little longer, yes, you can get your private in that. 
Now, here's an email from Don. And, oh, Don, I'm so happy that he's patient with me. He wrote in to uh, tell me a while back that I had uh, said something about dogfighting. And I responded in episode 85 and said, no, I didn't. Well, and he was kind and he said, hey, I heard your correction in episode 91. He said, you claim you didn't say dogfighting wouldn't happen in MOA. And he says, well, from 108 to 10820, you mentioned dogfighting, like I said. Mia culpa here, Don. Yep, you're right. <laughs> I, I said I didn't, and you're right, I did. But more importantly, uh, Don really took the high road here instead of saying, gee, Max, you screwed up here. He said, regardless, the important thing is that pilots should know that MOAs do contain flying that can be very hazardous to them if they don't talk to the controlling authority. So thanks so much for correcting me on that, Don. Uh, I really appreciate that. Here's an email from Breezy in Wisconsin. I love that name, by the way. She writes, hello, I recently joined Women in Aviation International, and I'm on the planning committee for Girls in Aviation Day coming up this October in my hometown. I know it's a ways out, but I was wondering if you have any ideas of interesting activities for young girls, 8 to 17 year old. It seems a lot of aviation events target boys and young men, and I think it's appropriate to give a shout out to the females in the industry as well. And I wrote back to Breezy. I said, I know that kids love simulators. So if you can set some up, the kids would love that. They don't have to be fancy. And I'm sure there'll be some flight sim geeks in your area with a computer set up with a sim. Alternatively, you could hold the event at an airport where hopefully there will be a flight school with a simulator. And I wrote that a classic kids activity at EAA events is building ribs for an aircraft. You might contact EAA to see if they have rib kits they can sell. I definitely contact a local RC flying club to see if they'd be willing to come out and demonstrate flying their model RC aircraft for the kids. And I gave her a link where you could find the nearest club, and that link will be on our show notes. Alternatively, I said, see if you can find someone who owns one or more drones to come out and demonstrate them. Some local police and fire departments now have drones, so you could ask them about coming out. And I said, if you're in an airport, for sure, invite the state police helicopter or local EMS medical helicopter. Uh, likewise, you could check with the Wisconsin National Guard to see if they can bring in a helicopter. Also, have the local fire department bring out an engine, even though it's not directly aviation related. Kids love climbing on fire engines. And I wrote one thing I know that my daughters really like to talk. So you might set up a simulation in which some of the girls are air traffic controllers and other girls are pilots. Then write a script for them to read, simulating an airliner coming in for a landing. And if you can find some headsets and microphones, that would be even better, though not necessary. Also, you might invite some women in aviation to come in and talk about aviation careers. Find a pilot or an air traffic controller, an airport manager, and so on. Anyway, I wrote to Breezy. Hope this helps. She wrote back and said a couple of those ideas were totally new to her, the RC Flying Club and also the ATC simulation. So she thanked me for that. So I hope that turns out to be a good event. Here's an email from Jeff here in California. It's a longer email, but he says in part, I've had this idea for the past several years, but I haven't followed up though with it. He says, I really want to reestablish my CFI. So apparently he let that expire. He says, uh, so I know I'm not eligible for a renewal. I'm looking for a recommendation on how to get started with this project and to see if you have time to help me out with this. And I wrote back and I said, I think the easiest way for you to get reinstated is to do a CFII check ride because I noticed in his ratings that Jeff does not have a CFII. And if he does that check ride, First, I think it's a little easier than the CFI check right. And second, you'll get a new additional rating for about the same amount of work or maybe even less work. And it reinstates all of his other ratings. And uh, I was talking later with uh, our, one of our Patreon supporters, Jason Blair, and he said that anyone who has an expired CFI can do any new CFI rating, even a glider CFI rating, and that will reinstate all of your CFI ratings. So thanks so much for that additional information there, Jason. And this comes from Joshua in Ontario. He says, I've just listened to episode 87 in my attempt to catch up. I just felt as though I had to let you know how amazing the interview and the story truly was. I was in tears listening to the doctor retelling his side of the story and describe his understandably peaceful resignation. This, by the way, was a doctor who had lost all electricity in his uh, cardinal and was uh, up in the clouds and realized, yeah, this might be the end of it for him. Anyway, Joshua writes, it's truly one of the most beautiful stories that I've heard regarding aviation. ATC were true heroes that day. Not that they aren't every day. I have nothing but respect and admiration for those people. Keep up the amazing work. Well, thanks so much, Joshua. And what I will tell you is I just finished an interview today that I think you're going to like about a somewhat similar kind of story. So <laughs> stay tuned for that. 
And if you or someone you know is interested in buying any model of Cirrus airplane or jet, or if they're interested in flight training, please contact me today for a free consultation. In some cases, I can arrange a free demo for you. And I'll also be happy to talk with you about all the ins and outs of buying new versus used. The call's free. Just call me at 650-967-2500 or go to aviationnewstalk.com and click on contact at the top of the website. And you can also use that to leave any listener questions or give us any feedback. I specialize in the Cirrus and work with people like you around the world. And also, please check out our Patreon site. And if you're in a position where you might be able to help us out on the show, please go ahead and sign up to donate a few dollars every month via credit card. Patreon site's at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. And finally, please just take a minute or two to think about, hey, is there one friend out there maybe who you think might like this show? And maybe they don't know what a podcast is. Well, just go ahead and send them out to the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store, and they can download our dedicated Aviation News Talk podcast app for iOS and Android. It's in the App Store. Just go ahead and search for Aviation News Talk. And of course, the apps are free. So until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up.